Doctor. I'm a Time Lord. I'm from the planet Gallifrey in the constellation of Casterberus. I hope the ears are a bit less conspicuous this time. You might be a Doctor, but I am... I'm a Doctor. There's probably nothing on the experience. Absolutely fantastic. All of time and space, everything that ever happened or ever will. Where do you want to start? Yep, I'm recording. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Big Money Inside the New Who Doctor Who Watch Long Podcast. How are you doing, Harry? I'm doing pretty good, thanks, Tim. How are you? I'm good. I'm very good. Coming out later this week, guys, we've got a number of videos over on the channel. You go to Twitter and you can check that out. But uh, I've also this is a big week here. for us. It is. It's like almost something going on every day of the flipping week, mother flippers. Yeah. It's a good month. time to be subscribed to Bigger on the Inside. It definitely most certainly is. On Monday, we're going to be announcing a very... Oh, uh, you already have seen this, if you know. On Monday, we announced a very special guest, Miranda Raisin, who will be joining us in Series 3 of Bigger on the Inside. For those of you who don't know, she was in Spooks, Merlin... Vexed, and of course played um, Tallulah in Doctor Who Series 3 alongside David Tennant, Andrew Garfield, and um, who else was in that episode? Free Rajaman. So she's going to be joining us in the near future. And also on Monday we uploaded the third instalment of the Big Finish Battles series with myself and Harrison. Um, on Tuesday we'll be uploading this. Wednesday and Thursday you're going to get your normal random videos. Friday... What's going on on Friday? Oh yeah, the 200 subscribers special goes out on Friday. Some really cool, exciting guests appearing in that. Saturday, nothing. Go and watch The Mass Singer. Sunday, we'll be doing the tweet along um, by the amazing Emily Cook over on Twitter where everybody's going to be talking about um, one of our personal favourite episodes, Love and Monsters. But we haven't. the review for that hasn't come out yet. Spoilers. We really liked it. So that's exciting, isn't mm. it, Harry? It is. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's great. It is rather a lot of stuff. Um, let's touch yeah. on something we spoke about last week. Um, I don't know about you, but the sort of there was big news for maybe two or three days that Jodie Whittaker was, was rumored to be leaving Doctor Who, and then there's kind of been nothing since. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like if anything, I've heard kind of rumors from people saying that she's not actually leaving, and yeah. if that is the case, then. I mean, at least it means down the line we'll be able to just make more videos speculating about who could be replacing her when she is, in fact, leaving. Yeah, got to get those uh, red circles and red arrows out for the thumbnails again. Mm. Yeah, but the more time <laughs> that passes, the more I'm starting to doubt that Jodie actually is leaving. But if that no, is the I... case, if Jodie... Hmm? Go on. I was just say, if that was the case and Jodie actually is going to stick around beyond Series 3, will that make her the longest-serving New Who Doctor? Uh, yeah, it will do, yeah. Maybe not, and also maybe actually in years in the role as well, because of course she had a, se- a year where there was no series. Um, mm. So yeah, but I personally think that she should stick around for another series. I don't really feel like we've got to know this incarnation that well yet. So another series speci- would be really welcomed. Especially because series 13 is effectively being, I don't think it's quite half, I think it's just going to be eight episodes. But that is a significant reduction in the usual length of a Doctor Who series. Yeah, 100%. Um, talking of Jodie leaving, John Barrowman has had his say on who he thinks would make a good replacement. Um, John Barrowman has been the latest to nominate an actor for the title role. In an interview with the UK morning chat show Lorraine, Barrowman revealed that he thinks that Ollie Alexandra should take over the role uh, after watching him in Russell T. Davies' latest drama, It's a Sin, he went on to explain why Alexandra, um, who is also known for being the lead singer in the British synth pop band Years and Years, is his number one pick. Um, Barrowman said, Ollie would be amazing. He's quirky, he's fun, and he's a lovely actor, and I think he would make a wonderful doctor. Now, am I suffering a deja vu, or is, there, is the, John Barrowman the second person to suggest that uh, Ollie would be a good doctor? He is Russell. We spoke about Russell thinking that Ollie would make a good doctor last week. Yeah, so it definitely seems like a lot of people would like him. I know I've yeah. spoken to a few people who would really are keen on it. I'm slightly apprehensive just because I feel maybe he looks too young. And I know Matt Smith was young, but Matt Smith sort of has that aged quality. But then again, I have only seen him in um, It's a Sin. 
Yeah. Now, I remember I spoke quite extensively about him when Russell brought him up. I just want to know what your opinion on him is as an actor, because I know that now you've watched at least three episodes of It's a Sin, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, so I guess slight spoilers for It's a Sin if you haven't caught up on that yet. Uh, but we're not going to be spoiling the full watch series. Watch it. Seriously, watch it. It's so yeah. good. Um, I'm on episode three, I think. Um, but yeah, I think I he's a really good actor. Five. Okay, well, don't tell me anything. Uh, I, I think he's great. He isn't get. He didn't get as much screen time last week, and it's a sin. But I think he's great. I'm just gonna Google him to see what he looks like, like out of uh, out of the show, because uh, I know like he has like a very distinctive um, like style. Like yeah, I'm like looking at pictures of him now, and he's got short, dyed red hair. But then I see other pictures of him. He's got like long, sort of wavy hair. So he's definitely somebody who's willing to change his appearance. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say because, like, you look at pictures of Jodie when she was in Broadchurch and she doesn't look like the Doctor, but then you see her like she looks like now, and of course she looks like the Doctor. Am I correct in thinking that when it comes to the actual style of a Doctor, it's very often the actor themselves who gets to have a big say in how they look, at least in New York? Yeah, my understanding is, yeah, because obviously they have to spend a lot of time in that costume. I usually think there's some guidance from the from the showrunner but apart from that it really is up to uh yeah. up to the actor really how much involvement they decide to have in the costume i know jody yeah. brought in a number of photos of people and um, i think she was of quite course. keen on having it as a even though it, she's a female playing a female character uh the clothes she wears are not distinctively female mm. i mean in fact my kind of avatar for this channel is wearing jody's outfit yeah that's true yeah of course yeah um mm. Do you want to move on? Pell Mackey has been talking about the importance of Bill Potts and LGBT... Uh, uh, hang on. LGBTQ plus representation in Doctor Who. Oh, was it she said specifically? And she says, it all feels like a bit of a whirlwind to me because I'm such a huge fan uh, of things that... Are, uh, oh, hang on, I'm reading the wrong quote here. My apologies. Uh, getting a job and being cap- catapulted into the amazing world and this huge fandom... And also opening up to this world of LGBTQ fandom that had been there in the Doctor Who community, but hadn't had, apart from Captain Jack, like a solid companion um, to channel the representation, them essentially. Pell added that it's phenomenal the amount of people she has heard from who have told her Bill helped them to come out to their families. I've just seen, I've met a lot of people to whom Bill was a huge catalyst. In, a- in a- enabling them to come out to their families, uh, which is something that they never really think they never really th- you never really think about as an actor. Uh, it's phenomenal the amount of people who have told me that without Bill they wouldn't have been able to come out to their family, without seeing someone. Oh, then she goes on to talk about a new drama she's in. So I think that's a uh, it's. I think as two straight white dudes, it's very hard to sometimes understand. And well, not understand, but feel the importance of something like this within a show. Mm. We can understand it, but you can never really feel it for what it's worth. So when like Pearl talks about it, I think it's really helpful for a lot of people who can suddenly start to sort of see the importance of it. Because to me, when Bill was in the show, she was a fantastic companion. I was quite gutted that she was never ca- she never carried on to Jodie. I will feel the one series, even though it was a really good season, she had a great send off. I really would have liked to have seen more of um, Pearl on Doctor Who. Um, so it's great that even in such a short period of being on the show, she was a that character was able to have such an impact on so many people. Yeah, I mean, I guess I've never really. It's not something I considered really, kind of the impact that it would have had on people personally. But yeah, you know, Doctor Who is like a big British staple, and so for it to have for just even just one series a companion who is openly a lesbian really goes a long way to kind of normalizing that for people yeah so oh, definitely it's, yeah so it's great that it had that impact and now with yaz as well with the possible inclusion of yaz's sexuality sort of becoming more open yes. within the show it's definitely Has great Chibnall, that this is... is it correct that chibnall has said that yaz is bisexual I don't know. I don't think anything has been said it said solidly yet. I know there's been I've... a lot of rumours going around. I'm not sure. But I don't want to quote someone on something that if, for example, Fair. if we turn up in six months' time and we go, oh, we were wrong again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it's great that this that it isn't just 
Okay, so here's the thing. Doctor Who is a show in which anything could happen. So why not make anything happen? I don't understand yeah. the backlash. I, I do understand the backlash, but I don't understand. I don't agree with it. Um, mm, cause like it's, it's, it's a, a show which can go anywhere in all of space and time. I find it hard to believe that in all of space and time, you only encounter straight people. You know. Yeah, exactly, one hundred percent. I know we spoke a little bit earlier about the fact that Ollie, Ag- Ollie Alexandra might be the next Doctor. How would you feel about RuPaul's Drag Race star season two queen Tia Coffey being the next Doctor? Is that someone who's been rumored? Okay, so Ru, I'm, I'm reading this directly from BleedingCool.com. Um, Doctor Who Drag Race UK star Tia Coffee can I just say is an amazing drag race name Tia Coffee Tia Coffee mm. fantastic um, she British. says she's yeah is up for being the next Doctor RuPaul's Drag Race UK season 2 queen Tia Coffee isn't shy about her geeky roots and those roots came out from a came out in a recent press interview where she talks about what Doctor Who means to her and how the long running um, quintessentially UK sci-fi classic influenced her drag. Tia grew up with sci-fi television staple Doctor Who, which has uh, which has gone on to influence her act and character as a performer, as a cosplayer, and an out of pond ge- and out and proud geek. She talks about what the show means to her. I'm a massive geek. And I like to think that I'm I'm a glamorous geek, so I try to use some of those geeky influences in my drag. And I think things like Doctor Who have a sort uh, have sort of given me that element of camp and the element of sort of ridiculousness that I think of just what uh, sorry that element of ridiculousness that I kind of just want to have a good time when it comes to drag. Doctor Who is massively camp, isn't it? Absolutely, it's so camp. Um, I mean, I remember, um, I think kind of toward the end of Russell's era, um, there was that, I don't know if it was on Confidential or something, but they did like the ballad, of John Barrowman, uh, Catherine Tate and David Tennant oh, did yes. this um, thing, the ballad of, um, was it uh, Russell and... Julie Gardner, Was it yeah. Judy? Julie, yeah. And they, one of the lyrics in there was, make it more camp. Yeah. They, they, it's a show they openly admit themselves. It's a very camp show. And it's been camp for, I mean, so long. I know in the 80s, at least the 80s, it's been a very, you know, colourful, bold show. It's it's in its DNA. That's part of Doctor Who. 100%, especially when Russell was in charge. You know, just by having Russell and his writing style, only recently when we've gone back and looked at it for the show, maybe it's something we should talk about more next time, but um, it is incredibly camp, and there is a lot I mean, of yeah. um, elements of it which I would expect to find in a in a in a program that grounds itself as being an alternative program, like um, it's a sin or queer as folk. There is a lot of elements within that. I mean, I'm just thinking right now of an, ep- of an episode like. Ah, oh, here we go again. Harry's disappeared. Two. I can't hear Harry again. Oh wait, yes I can. Harry, I can hear can you. Hear me. Great. Yeah, I tend I tend I tend my microphone off. <laughs> Good. I was just saying I was just thinking of like an episode like New Earth in in series two, and you know that is so camp. They're in this bright futuristic city. There's all these like cat people around. Uh, they like they've got Cassandra like chewing up the scenery. Yeah. Especially when she takes over. Um, Rose and the t- Doctor's bodies. <laughs> it, it's, un, it's, un, it's um, unapologetically a camp show. Yeah, and it, and that's part of why I love it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, maybe that sort of element has been lost recently, but when it came back, one hundred percent. I also think a little bit through the Moffat era as well. It kept it held on to that very strongly. Hmm. Mm. Especially with Amy and Rory and the dots of that weird freeway triangle that they had going on. Yeah, I feel like kind of those weird dynamics are kind of what makes those TARDIS teams kind of so interesting because you kind of get kind of just because like the Doctor is such a strange character and he very often picks up you know people who are a little bit you know not normal. I mean, you wouldn't you have to be a little you know strange Eccentric. to want to yeah. 
Uh, there's a new Doctor Who game on the way. You excited, Harry? What kind of game? Okay, so this is from Tom Phillips over at Eurogamer. Blink is one of the best Doctor Who, uh, one of the best episodes ever of Doctor Who, and it's now getting a mobile game sequel. Doctor Who: The Lonely Assassins launches on iPhone and Androids on the 19th of March, and has been designed as a found phone game with live action performances from Doctor Who characters. Unit expert Osgod, uh, Osgood, uh, Osgod or Osgood, Osgod, Osgood. Osgood. Yeah, Osgood, Osgood. Is in- Osgood is investigating the Osgood. events of- yeah, I know. of the legendary Blink episode and the subsequent disappearance of Larry, one of its characters. Blink star Finley Roberts returns as Larry and alongside Ingrid Oliver as Osgood. Hmm. What do you think of that? I think I've actually had adverts on YouTube for this. Yes. Well, when... Um- when I talked about the return of the Weeping Angels first, I spoke about the fact that I wasn't sure if the set photos we were seeing were just for uh, the the mobile game, but no, it does seem that they were for the show and that we are going to be getting this um, mobile game as well. It does look really interesting from what I've seen. I'm not sure. I'm hoping a lot of it means going. At, obviously, we're in a pandemic, but hopefully, a lot of it means almost like Pokemon Go. You go out and you hold your phone up, and there's a Weeping Angel, and you have to do something on your phone in the real world rather than just sitting on your bed and playing the game mm. so it sort of maybe uses like a VR element um, you know what I'm trying to say or AR yeah like an augmented reality thing yeah sorry AR yeah I'm not a gamer I don't even own a console I I, I don't own a model console either oh, well that's, that's us that's the two of us and subscribe for more non-gaming canon references I generally just <laughs> video games never interested me certain ones do but not a lot I was into video games when I was like a teenager but um, I mean now I don't think my phone could even run a he- an intensive mobile game no well I've pre-ordered this game and I'm hopefully going to be doing a few videos on it with Harrison um, so do stick around to try and find out what we think of that um, but in the meantime do you want to talk a little bit about Doctor Who Series 13 um, yeah what is there to talk okay. about about it okay so Chris Chibnall says John Barrowman brings a different flavour to Doctor Who um, the com- uh, Doctor Who showrunner Chris Chibnall has praised comedian and actor John Bishop for bringing a different flavour and a different humour in his role as companion Dan in series 13 of the BBC sci-fi show. Bishop, uh, I'm just trying to find a direct quote here that I can read from. Here we go. I'm not sure where he's spoken this. Um, I think it's in. It's usually in the Doctor Who magazine. Here we go. Explaining why he cast Bishop in the new series, Chibnall told Doctor Who magazine, I've always got my eye out for performers who are loved and wondering how good they might be as actors. Uh, there's a great history of performers who start out as comedians transpo- um, transitioning into becoming terrific actors. For example, um, Robbie... Ro- oh, who the heck is this? Robbie Coltana? Coltrane? C-O-L-T... Robbie Coltrane? Yeah, in Crackers. Yeah. Who's that? Um, I, yeah, I, I know, I've heard of him, yeah. I, I'll say I can't remember that. Robbie Coltrane, oh, well. sorry, just give me um, a second. And then he, give me a second, okay, just, goes, just give me a second. Okay, okay I'll carry on I'm reading. Just gonna go, I'm just going to Google Robbie Coltrane. John's somebody I've been keeping my eye on for years. He's quietly built up a body of work through working with people like Jimmy McGovern, McGovern and Ken Loach, whilst also doing dozens of other things like stand-up, autobiographies, interview shows, podcasts and travel documentaries. Chibnall revealed that Bishop was still uh, was still required to audition for the role. Um, as ever on Dot Two, we put him through rigorous multi-session audition processes, uh, which which he engaged with brilliantly and humbly. The broadcast creator continued, John and his character bring a different flavour and a different humour to the show. We're loving him in the rushes. We're having him uh, and having him part of the production. Have you found out who that person was yet? Robbie Coltrane's Hagrid. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I don't. I've never. I've only seen two Harry Potter films, so that probably explains really? why we didn't. Yeah. 
<laughs> never really, never really caught my eye. Uh, that's all the news for this week, Harry. It's a bit of a shorter news segment, wouldn't you say? Well, you can't have intensive news every week for Doctor Who. You know, they have to have Ma- some off weeks. Maybe we need to start Sometime. thinking of um of like topics in case there is no news. That's true. That's true. That's something to consider. It's Valentine's Day this Sunday. Are you going to be doing anything special for that? What what could I conceivably do? <laughs> <laughs> you could sit down. Um, I'm, do, I'm doing the transition here. I'm doing the transition. You could sit down and watch some telly. Some telly. Oh, I don't know. You hear what they say about telly. It um. It kind of. This is the Eden's Phantom this week, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. Okay, you know what they say about telly? Like, it, you know, sucks sucks your eyes in, you know? But some people call it uh, a, a lantern for it, it, idiots. Um, Talking of the idiots' lantern, enjoy our review of the idiots' lantern. Not two series, did two, they really come back. Did we talk next for an hour? What did we have to say? Did, we say, did I say an hour? What did, what did I say then? Yeah, he said an hour review of. No, our, our, from... our review. Oh, okay. Jesus uh, Christ. Well, you like the episode. <laughs> enjoy, but... enjoy our review, everybody. See you later. Bye. <laughs> See ya. Shut up. Shut up. Shut the up, up, up. This is a command from the Daleks. All listeners are demanded to subscribe to our Patreon. Subscribe or you will be exterminated. Seek, locate, subscribe. What's the point in having you all? Oh, well, that was some um, cracking news there, wasn't it, Harry? The best news I think I've ever heard. Yeah, who'd have believed? Who'd have believed? Unless it was bad news, then phew, that was the worst news. Yeah, that was tragic. It's really, really upsetting that happened, yeah. One day this skit's going to really come back and bite us in the ass. <laughs> when, like, Tom <laughs> Baker dies be, or something like that. That is going to be some exceptionally, exceptionally bad news. We'll probably yeah. just have to edit around this if that happens. <laughs> Uh, we're doing a watch long segment of the podcast. We're doing series two, episode seven. That sounds right. Could be right. Episode seven. I want to. See, yeah, I think it is episode seven, which is called what, Harry? The Idiot's Lantern by Mark Gatiss. No, I didn't realise this was a Mark Gatiss episode until it started, and it says his name. I had no idea. Oh. Huh. It seems to be one of his um, lesser known episodes. Um, we've got the listeners' Instagram reviews that I'll get to at the end. So if you have submitted something on our Instagram page, um, I'll read it out at the end. If you want to leave something for series three, just follow us on Instagram at um, Bigger on the Pod. I think it is on Instagram. If not, it's in the description. You can find it there. Um, yeah, The Idiot's yeah. Lantern uh, by Matt Gators. What did you think, Harry? Um. Okay, this is a weird response. I think this might be the memeiest episode we've had so far. <laughs> there are a lot of moments here that I just kind of found irrationally funny. <laughs> um, I found it very strange when the doctor finds out Rose has no face and he gets very angry and then he says, um, Let's go, for example, he says, so let's go find who did this. And he just walks off and leaves her standing in a room but with no face. Like, the way it's framed, obviously he's telling the inspector to come with him. But it's almost as if he's asking Rose to come with him. Yeah. <laughs> like it was hard to like Rose to like follow and like bang into the wall. <laughs> okay, so the episode starts with Magpie. Um, the actor's name escapes me. But um, we're going back to our new Series 2 tradition, of which is calling out actors who have starred in the live-action remake of Thunderbirds, which Harry hasn't seen. And pa- and uh, he played Parker, Lady Penelope's driver in Thunderbirds. <laughs> I remember. I remember that. Yeah, yes. He was doing, doing like a Michael Caine-type thing. He might have been. Yeah, I think he was. Yeah. yeah. Hello, Lady Penelope. Come with me. Tip top. <laughs> cheerio. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of characters in this episode, isn't there? Yeah, there's a lot going on. They packed a lot in, but it doesn't feel overwhelming. 
No, no. Oh, there's the there's obviously there's a Doctor and Rose, there's Magpie, there's um, the father, Tommy the son, the mum, the grandma, the detective inspector, the detective inspector's sidekick, the wire. So that's ten characters we see for regularly throughout the episode. Mm, and then there's mention, yeah. yeah. And then there's mentions of loads of other characters, such as Mr. Gallagher, who I imagine is Liam Gallagher, um, mm-hmm. just hanging around in 19, 1950s. <laughs> 19, was that right? 1950s? Well, 1953. Yeah. Okay, 1953. That's the coronation. <laughs> just hanging out at the coronation, going, oh, now sound, this is great, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> was, I don't think, was he even alive? I don't think so. I th- no, no, he won't have been. No. Let me have a look. Liam, Liam Gallagher. Let me see Bomb. Um, nineteen seventy-two. <laughs> right. So, like nineteen years off. <laughs> <laughs> we were close, but almost there. Um, yeah. What did you, you think? Very close. Yeah. What did you think to the the dad of the family? What's his name, Mister? Um, I didn't uh, make any name. Yeah. What do you think to him? Ah, uh, well, you know, he's a right piece of work, isn't he? Isn't he? They, they, he's one of those characters where you really just love to hate him. And yeah. they did a very really good job of portraying that. But in a way that was still believable. Like, it wasn't cartoonish. It was kind of just quite dark. He's a stereotypical man, isn't he? He's like... Yeah, like he is what you would expect him, not what you would expect a man to be. That's not what I'm trying to say, but if you were to stereotype everything about a man, he would be it. What you'd expect from a man in the 1950s. Yeah, and he also looks a bit like Ricky Gervais. Do you think, <laughs> Do you think so? Yeah, did, like, as soon as I saw him, he looked like Ricky Gervais. <laughs> Should have ripped out a guitar and started <laughs> singing a song for the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> just well, maybe at the end he would have just told everyone to like, stop being sensitive and it was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> I kid, I kid, I, I kid. I like, I like Ricky Gervais. No, I love Ricky. I don't like his stand-up. I don't like his stand-up, but I really enjoy his TV work. He's never been in Doctor Who, nor is Stephen Merchant, but David Tennant appears you, as uh, the... Do you not remember the iconic um, episode where David Tennant uh, defeated Ricky Gervais, the as alien, a slug. the cable salt? Yeah. yeah, we'll have to talk about that. I keep thinking of maybe doing episodes where we talk about where Doctor Who stars have appeared in other television programs, and yeah. I think we should do that episode, of, that Christmas special of extras. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's it's kind of incredible of thinking about what a big institution Doctor Who is that he managed to, you know, get permission to satirize Doctor Who in his show, but then again extras managed to get all kinds of big names. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, there's a line in this episode that I really like where the where the grandma at the start of the episode is talking about your brains leaking out your ears and your eyes falling out your eye sockets if you watch TV. And she says that's what television does. And I sort of thought that people still say that same crap now, don't they? I remember growing up and going, don't sit too close to the telly, it makes your eyeballs go square and it's weird. why do yeah. people well, say nowadays- that? It feels like that's always a thing with new mediums of entertainment. There's always a lot of skepticism and criticism around it. Like, you know, people said that about books. People say about um, television. Now people say it about video games or more so smartphones, yeah. tablets. So, yeah. And well, of course, like, if you did nothing but consume those, it'd be a bad thing. But yeah. if it is, you know, it's all good. And I find, I find it quite amusing that kind of, when the doctor arrived and uh oh what was the son called? Was um, Tommy. You know, when Tommy was like, Oh yeah, I love television, he was like, Yeah, yeah. good lad. Yeah. Good lad. <laughs> um, you mentioned it there, you mentioned like people were the same with books. Um I'll tell you a funny story when my mum was little. Um she would she read a lot and she would read books that were aimed at older audiences or would read a lot of horror and like mm. at the age of like 12 would read like these Stephen King books and stuff like that and like, like, like apparently once she was sat behind the door in the kitchen in the dark on a stool reading like a Stephen King book and my granddad came in and took the book and just threw it why? <laughs> I think that's true. I think that's true. I know sometimes my mum does listen to these, so I apologise if it is wrong, mum. 
but I'm pretty sure it's right that he just threw them, just just is like stop reading these damn books. <laughs> Uh, yeah, anyway, like, the fact, like, wasn't there like somewhere in America, like when the first Harry Potter came out, there was a whole book banning of it? Really? Yeah, because they were like, "Oh no, it encourages wish witchcraft and for children to be disobedient of their like um, authority figures." <laughs> I think anything that is aimed at a young generation instantly scares its older generation because it's that sudden realization think, of yeah. you're not the target audience anymore. I think also just kind of like anything for some reason I feel like there's ever increasing kind of in growing fear for children to be introduced to kind of challenging or scary um, concepts you know yeah no I agree yeah the doctor on a motorbike that's cool he comes yeah. out the town on a motorbike he also has different hair he does is... um I I watched yeah. Confidential in which they mentioned there's always an argument that when the Doctor travels back in time, he s- tends to make very little effort to blend into that time period. Like, for example, in An Unquiet Dead, Rose wears that outfit and the Doctor declares she looks beautiful. And then he steps out in his just leather jacket. He doesn't make any effort to blend yeah. in. Um, mm-hmm. So they were sort of saying, well, they didn't want to change the costume because the costume is iconic with the Doctor, so what could they do? So they just said, they just kind of just jazzed his hair up a bit. It gave him sort of a Elvis quiff. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Also, does does the Tenth Doctor just keep a like a moped just in his in his TARDIS? Then he must do. He must. You think no, there's I, like a garage room in the TARDIS? I think there is a. There's, I know there's a workshop. I know there's a workshop in the TARDIS. I don't know if there's okay. a garage. I once did look at all the rooms that have been mentioned in the TARDIS, and there is a garage and a work. Uh, and there's I know a it's definitely a swimming pool. I yeah. remember that from the Matt era. They mentioned a swimming pool. Yeah, um, I love the um, the father's reaction to the telly when they're watching like some mm. old kids' TV show. And he's like, "It's like it's in, in the, the pool, room. isn't it?" Yeah, and he's like, "Oh, it's in the room with us. It's amazing." Mm. No, I love people's reactions to television. Like, there's the um, the chief inspector later on, when there's this you know awful alien invasion. The thing that amazes him is a portable television and a color television. Yeah, it goes into color and he's amazed by it. Yeah, he's like, oh, color television. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, I of if, course, that would have been amazing at the time. I was know. gonna say, I wonder if people were actually totally amazed by that because what they're what I would be more amazed that I'm looking at something that's in black and white because that's not how it is. If they were to show me something in colour, I'd be like, well, that's how it looks. You're showing me something that I am looking at. You know what I mean? And I guess, kind of thinking back to, like, the age of, like, you know, not just colour television, but um, black and white television, but also... I'm at work... When... I'm trying to think, when did coloured photographs become a more common thing. In the 50s, were black and white photographs still very much the common thing? Or oh, was color photography? Um, you're asking a photographer here, Harry. Um, I have zero idea. <laughs> and Jerry, I have no idea. Oh. I'm trying. I'm thinking back to when my mum was a kid. So 60s, mid-60s. Um, and I'm thinking of the photos I've seen of them. They tend to be in black and white. But I imagine that there was colour photography at the time, but it probably wasn't as accessible as it is today. Obviously, yeah. it's instantly accessible today. So, I mean, imagine that um, kind of if black and white photography was the norm and, you know, television and film was kind of moving pictures, then yeah. I guess it was kind of expected for them to look like pictures, which were black and white. Yeah, especially at the time when you would go to the where you would go to the flicks and you would sit and watch a movie where there wouldn't actually be any sound apart from a little lady in the corner playing a piano <laughs> in time with well, the film. Well, you know, by, by the fifties, like talkies were very much you know a thing by then. Of course, yeah. Talkies have been. I mean, talkies were a thing all the way through the war and even before. Yeah. What's your favourite war film, Harry? What's your favourite film made during the war? Not about the made war. During, oh, about the war or during the war? During the war. Different. 1950s film. Well, that's after the war. Oh, okay. 1940s film. 
I honestly I need to brush up on films from the forties. Have you seen that, um, what? When was the when did the war end? Uh, it was the late forties. Oh God, I'm really being shown up for my lack of. No, I ask you because I, I I ask you because I do not know. <laughs> I should know. It's like basic, you know, history. Not I want to say 49, 48. So in the nineteen fifty. In the 1930s, you had The Wizard of Oz, Three Little Pigs, King Kong, All Quiet on the Western Front, A Star is Born, Robin Hood, Dracula. All these amazing films. I, 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 say, I, I say that ironically. Some of these are amazing films. The Wizard of Oz is one of my favourite films. But the Wizard of Oz is just timeless, you yeah. know? Like, children today love it. Like, that film is never going to age. Yeah. Um, welcome to our Doctor Who podcast. So far, we've talked about Ricky Gervais, <laughs> The Wizard of Oz. Um, I mean, we've talked about something else at the start as well that I can't remember. Um, Doctor Who always has this really good way of making old people scary. You think so? Well, I remember in, in Matt Smith in Amy's what? Choice, there's that thing where old people are like trying to eat everybody and they've got like big teeth. I think so. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. Especially in this as well, like the whole idea of just like the grand just being left in the attic and all she does is just bang on the thing. That's quite scary, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole kind of thing of like a television sucking someone's face off reminded me of a lot of kind of like Stephen Moffat stories and kind of just the simplicity of taking something that's so everyday, you know, a TV set or, you know, a person yeah. and just like changing them just enough to make them quite scary like, i feel like you know those people about faces are probably the most unsettling things we've seen all series so far yeah the one thing i always found about doctor is i never found the monsters scary it was usually what they were trying to do or what they had done that was scary like taking people's faces and leaving them in a pen or mm. you know having a gas mask fall out of your face and stuff like that. That's horrible to watch, but I never actually found them to be scary. Yeah, I mean, I didn't find it scary just as much kind of like unsettling, like unsettling that that could happen to a person. Yeah, there's a scene where... And the idea of like that happening. Yeah, the scene where the gran, or Mr. Gallagher at the start gets taken away and the Doctor and Rose follow them on the moped could the doctor not work mm. out that they had just disappeared behind the the gate, the big gate? Uh, the doctor isn't the quickest to figure things out in this episode. Like even like Rose puts the whole thing about television sets together before the doctor goes yeah. and goes to Magpie like way before him. This is the first episode as well, I think, where we really get a good look at the tenth doctor without Rose. We sort of see his character a bit more because in previous episodes where they've been split up. We normally end up following Rose for a lot of it. Well, you look at a new earth and they both swap around with Cassandra. Tooth and Claw, they're sort of together quite a lot. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, school reunion is very much Sarah Jane. Rise of the Cybermen is mainly about Rose and Mickey. So this one is the Doctor, really. It's about the Doctor. And it's yeah. probably one of the first times. Yeah, definitely, yeah. It's one of the first times we get to really see how David Tennant plays as the Doctor. And I think it's a really great episode. For, yeah. for that reason, to me, anyway. like, with, yeah. with that in mind, it really feels like by this point, Tent has fully come into his own. Like, the way he's acting, moving about, interacting with people just feels so, like, you know, iconic with what I associate with the Tenth Doctor. You know, stuff like the I'm not listening. Mm. Ah. <laughs> like, that's such an iconic Tenth Doctor line moment, but I don't think any other Doctor would have been able to say in quite the way that he said it and with yeah. quite that impact another iconic line from this episode is where there's a knock at the door and he opens it to the doctor and rose and they both just go hi <laughs> one scene which i actually forgot about and loved was um when the um inspector came to take the gran away and the doctor tries to reason with him and they just smack him. Yeah, I completely <laughs> forgot about that. Yeah, it was like... They just it, knock him clean out. Yeah, as it was coming up, I was like, oh, I remember. Like, only, like, seconds before it happened there. Yeah, it's great. 
I can't believe, I thought that was hilarious. Because it, it's one of those things where you think, why does that never happen? Why does no one ever just punch him? And then when it does happen, he gets yeah. fully knocked out. <laughs> yeah, because the doctor, he doesn't want to fight back most of the time, you know, no. unless he's a sword. Yeah. Um, the scene where the Doctor and Rose enter the, I'm going to have to look at their names because it's really annoying me, the Conley House, that's the name, when he enters the Conley House, um, and the way the Doctor and Rose instantly just degrade the father and yeah. only listen to the, the mother and the son. And then he's like, but the, I love the father's reaction to find out that they're like part, they're there to like inspect how patriotic they're being. And he's like, oh, we're going to yeah. have our flags up and everything. I'll do it now. You'll be so proud of us. I love just how much joy Rose visibly got from bringing him down a peg. Yeah, she does, doesn't she? Yeah, because she's almost like, like at the end, like there's a lot of she like, has to go at him about the flag jack thing at the end, and then she, like, she gives just like this really cheeky smile before just like dashing off. Yeah, because it's almost like because yeah. there's a scene where he demand where the doctor says why aren't the flags up, and he's then he busts his wife for not putting the flags up because she's a woman and therefore she should be doing housework in the early 1950s. Um, so I almost feel like there's that sort of that's her almost reason for wanting to bring this guy down is just because he's just a yeah. sexist man and that, yeah, they that almost whole... immediately take Sorry, a disliking yeah they do don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do they don't even know that he's like part of the reason everything is going wrong but it's like the second they enter the house they dislike him hmm. um, so Doctor and Rose are just I think where where you see them together in this episode is really great. They they, they have a yeah. they s- s- seem to be just traveling for fun. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And that's contagious. It's very contagious. Yeah. And I don't feel like. I mean, I, I while I wouldn't say that Rose is my favorite companion for the tenth Doctor. Um, based on what I remember for his following companions, what? I feel like just the amount his, his of His following enjoyment. companions? What are you talking about? It's a Doctor and Rose forever. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Tim. I forgot about that. Well, sorry. I was going to say, I'm in Confidential, about, when I'm, Confidential I'm, ending... I'm thinking, about a different, I'm thinking about a different show about doctors um, okay. who work with people. Um, yeah, ignore me. Because um, at the end of Confidential, they were saying that it seems like they were sort of suggesting that they were going to split up, but that, well, that's not right, because the show's still going now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had um, uh, 11 glorious series of David Tennant and Billy Piper. That's okay. I, I look forward to endless episodes with them. Um, yeah. Did you ever once think that the television was speaking to you? Um, what, like growing up as a kid? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I think I climatized the idea that, like, television wasn't, like, you know, a special thing just in my house. It was in everyone's houses <laughs> pretty early on. Yeah. I'd like, like I, to think. I always knew it was television, but once I was caught out and freaked out when I must have been about four, maybe even younger, and was downstairs and Sesame Street was on, and it was Elmo in, like, his little paper-drawn house with his fish. Oh yeah, um, Elmo's well. Yeah. yeah, and he like was talking to the audience. It must be like one of the first times I must have ever seen it. But like mm. he said something, and I like remember looking, and then he said something else, and I remember like replying, and then he replied, and like as a kid, it like freaked me out. I remember yeah, running up the so stairs. Funny. Yeah, I remember like, what the fuck is this? And like just pegging it out of the room and being like, the telly's talking. And ever since then, I've had a very strong vendetta against Elmo. Well, I didn't even realise that we had any kind of Sesame Street Elmo stuff on the U- in the UK. I didn't realise Sesame Street was in, on UK I don't think TV. We had, I don't think we had Sesame Street, but we had something to do with Elmo. I only ever remember yeah. Elmo. I don't remember Bert and Ernie or anything like that. I know there's currently, definitely, a some kind of Sesame Workshop show. Not Sesame Street, but something containing like Cookie Monster Elmo or something. The yes. show I remember growing up was The Hoops. Uh, yeah, the hoops, yeah. yeah. You, you know who the hoops are. Yeah, yeah. I've agreed to uh, the hoops and the coming your way. <laughs> I was thinking if this episode was set now, they wouldn't be watching the coronation. They'd be watching probably Gavin and Stacey. 
<laughs> the Christmas a million people go around that set to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me it's tomorrow. Pub. I'll wait by the window. <laughs> Everyone's faces get so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the doctor's interrogation scene that's great where he's being interrogated and then he switches the whole interrogation and then he's interrogating the detective I think that's brilliant yeah that was that was fantastic like watching that I was kind of just thinking like the way he was responding the way he was acting he was like it kind of took me back to like this is the doctor I knew growing up this is my perception of the doctor this funny quirky smart guy who always has the upper hand yeah, because it's the way it's like, tell me everything you know. And he just starts telling him everything he knows. <laughs> just to take him off. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, Maureen Lippman is the wire. I think she's great in this. She's quite, quite actually quite scary. She's Yeah, she's fantastic. She's got like that the right level of kind of like old time presenter alongside that really creepy undertone. Yeah. I remember as a kid, Finding the whole thing of the faces being stuck off with her screaming, like, hungry, feed me. <laughs> I remember finding that really creepy as a kid. Today, that was, again, one of the things I found kind of funny, but funny in a good way. <laughs> yeah, funny because you probably once found it scary. Yeah, but now I'm like, it's it's just kind of enjoyment. Like, Doctor Who's one of those shows where, especially with this era, era, that even if it's a bit silly or a bit camp, which I think the show knows it can be, yeah. it's still enjoyably so. It's not like distracting or takes away from it. No. And then when it's genuinely creepy, that's a bonus. And it very often kind of treads that line of kind Definitely. of being a bit of both. What sh- something we've never really spoken about is the set design on Doctor Who and how well, when they, especially when they go to historical eras, they dress the set to represent that. And you, I think you see that a lot in this because obviously they think they're in New York and then they very quickly realise they're not in New York, they're in North London. Yeah. Um, but look, this, it, it, North London, 1950s, it looks amazing. And even like the set, like the, the interior of the houses looks great. Mm, no, they do a fantastic job. But I think this episode has always stood out to me as one which does a particularly good job of capturing that era. And especially because it's, it's not just something like Victorian era or medieval era because they'd always be able to get those right because, you know, the BBC make all kinds of period yeah. programs. But the 50s is a bit more niche than that. So for them to really nail it like this is great. Yeah, it would be easy to sort of go, it's the 50s and we know it's the 50s because they're playing a 50s song on the on the jukebox or something like that. But they actually go to the effort of dressing people. Like I remember when we watched Father's Day. I was like, well, I know it's the 80s because as soon as they stepped out the TARDIS, I could hear, um, I think you could hear like a hard take on me or something like that. Like the yeah. second they stepped you out. You definitely hear Rick Astley at some point, don't you? I think that was it. I think that's what you hear, yeah. <laughs> um, do you have anything else to say about the Idiot's Lantern? Also, why is uh, it called the Idiot's Lantern? That's a very good question. <laughs> is the Idiot magpie and his lantern the wire I or is tweet it like, Mark is it, <laughs> is it, I think the television is the idiot's lantern like the idea of a television set being an idiot's lantern like you know it lights up a room at night and it's for like idiots who can't I'm guessing it must be maybe some kind of phrase from the 50s like made by people who are like anti-tv or something yeah I'm just going to tweet yeah. Mark Gatiss now and ask him. <laughs> it just... is interesting. Why is it called they... the Idiot's Lantern? Question mark. It's interesting that they do call it that because the sh- the episode, while you know the big kind of threat is TVs, it's not an anti-TV episode by any means. Like the Doctor is shown to be you no know, pro-TV. Everyone yeah. gets after like the face sucking ends is enjoying watching the coronation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's really great. Do you have anything else to add? I don't think so. We've uh, covered it pretty comprehensively. Good, because let's do a quiz! You! You! Not me! I hate being patient! Patience is for wimps! Oh, boy! Love that jingle. Let's go! Well, I know you're going to get one of these right, because you've already mentioned it in this episode. Oh, heck. 
Okay, okay. so question number one. What singer does the do does the doctor... Uh, the, the, at the start of the episode, it's implied that Jackie is a fan of what singer? Cliff Richard. Yes! You got one out of three. I pay attention to the conversations that the Doctor and Rose have at the start of the episode because one of the questions is always about that. So I'm say... <laughs> oh, well, I know now. I'm not going to do that. Oh, well, uh, I'm not going to get any questions in the future. What TV show, what children's TV show are the Conley family watching when they first get the television set? Muffin the Mule. Yes, two out of three. See if you can get this one. At the end of the episode, when we see everybody in the Connolly's house watching the coronation, do they have a dog or a cat on the sofa? Oh, goodness. I did not spot this one. This is a 50-50. I am going to say a cat. Oh, two mm. out of three. Oh, hurt. It was a dog. A little poochy dogger. Oh. You tried, though. You did very well. You should be very proud of yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'm getting have... better. I'm getting better at this. You are getting better. Do you have anything you'd like to recommend? Before I go, I just want to tell you you were fantastic. Because I've, I've got one thing. Go first. I do have a thing, yeah. Oh, you go first, then. Yeah. Uh, this is a film from um, 1989. Um called War of the Roses. Have you ever seen it? Heard of it? I've seen it. I've heard of it, though. Yeah, it's a film by uh, Danny DeVito. Uh, he directed it, and he uh, is one of the stars in it. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a dark comedy. It's a dark comedy about this um, couple who uh, fall in love, get married, have kids, but then 18 years into their marriage, um, it just kind of starts to fall apart, and the two of them start doing kind of increasingly venomous acts to each other before and then during their whole divorce proceedings and it's just very funny kind of like the ways in which they kind of get one upon each other and how their acts of revenge become increasingly kind of venomous and out there and you know it gets to the point where they're borderline trying to kill each other and it's just if you like dark comedy it's great it's got a great energy to it um, Danny DeVito is fantastic in it, as are the uh, other the two leads playing the Roses, which is why it's called War of the Roses. Because yes, the Michael Douglas and Rose. Kathleen Turner. That's right, that's right. I couldn't remember it off the top of my head. Also, um, Dan Castellaneta, the voice of Homer Simpson's in this, as Man in Although chair. I don't believe... Yeah, he doesn't talk, he doesn't talk, because the way that the film is framed is um, that... Um, Dan Castanella is a uh, ghost to Dan DeVito who plays a kind of divorce attorney lawyer saying he wants to divorce his wife. Yeah. And to talk him out of it, Dan DeVito tells him the story of the roses and their divorce. Oh, uh, okay, right, I see. Yeah. That sounds good, no, that sounds good. I, it's, I like that. I like twisted stuff like that. It sounds funny. It's very twisted. No, I feel like you'd enjoy it. You'd certainly uh, enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. Well, what I'm going to recommend, I'm pretty sure I haven't recommended this before. Um, I'm going to recommend the Channel 4 sitcom Toast of London, written by and starring Matt Berry from the IT crowd. It's out on Netflix UK. I think I must have been watched it at least 20 times now. Um, it's just I realize you wrote it. Yeah, it's just incredibly stupid and funny. Um, for example, I was watching it last night and I noticed something I'd never seen before. Well, there's a conversation between Matt Berry's character and his acting agent. And it's like mm -hmm. a the camera keeps switching between the two. So it's Matt Berry to his agent, Matt Berry to his agent. And as it goes to Matt, back to Matt Berry, it's not Matt Berry. It's just a random guy in the same makeup and outfit. And then it's never addressed. It just carries on. I've never noticed it before. And there's characters with one eye. Peter Davison is a series regular in series two, I think. Um, yeah, it's really good fun. It's really good laugh. It's silly Britishness, but not so silly that you sort of feel like you have to be part yeah. of an exclusive club to enjoy it sort of thing. It's not like the Mighty Boosh. Yeah, it's not like that. Or maybe a little bit like League of Gentlemen as well, which I think sometimes can be a bit like, oh, I don't really yeah, know if this yeah. is for me. I, I know what you mean, because I love the League of Gentlemen, but I'm not a very big fan of the Mighty Boosh. And yeah. I think it's that thing. But like sometimes it does feel like 
it's a bit of an in joke or it's a bit impenetrable for audiences. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, I can't because I, it's weird because there's some my boo stuff I really like, but then some stuff that feels like it's all a big in joke that I'm not in on. It's a weird one. It's a weird one. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Monty Python? I adore Monty Python. I've I never really Python. got into it. And I think a lot of that's down to the fact that people think they're like really elite if they know a Monty Python joke. All right. Really, really. I mean, did you did you grow up with Python or because I was introduced to it at the age of like eleven or twelve? Not really. I've only recently sort of been right. I've always known who Monty Python are, and I've known who John Cleese yeah. is and everyone like that. Have like you a... started with are you starting with the sketch show or the films? Because we got shown uh, Life of not Life of Brian, uh, the Holy Grail in film studies. Oh, I didn't like. You weren't a big fan. Not really. I liked the idea and the concept of it, but I was just like, ah, uh, sort of, just didn't really work for me. Mm. Um, maybe it's like a thing of, I don't know. That, that surprised me because <laughs> I, me and my brother, we got kind of when we were kind of tweens early teens we got a dvd of um christopher holy grail and it was it kind of for me it was like this epiphany of like because i didn't realize you could get away with being that silly yeah. in a film because yeah. it's so wonderfully silly like i like some of their stuff like I, I don't know what it's from but there's like a song about having loads of kids and like wearing a condom or something like that and i found that's that from ha- the music yeah and i found that really funny when i saw that but i just found that one sketch funny maybe i wouldn't find the actual full film like the black knight sketch um tis but a scratch i think that's hilarious but i just didn't really enjoy the movie i don't know why i mean to be fair yeah i think there's a lot of hit and miss sketches with monty python yeah. like some in it's even their narrative films are really just a series of ske- loosely connected sketches. Yeah. And some of them are really funny, and some of them admittedly don't hold up quite so well. It's true. Uh, anyway, so we'll bring this one to a close. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can follow us at Bigger on the Pod, YouTube, Bigger on oh. the Inside Podcast. You all right? What about the uh, Instagram? Um, messages oh. about the episode? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shit. Good point. Yeah. Good thinking. Yeah, I'm uh, sure there's a real. I, I I bet there's one in particular that's really insightful. You've have you sent a message in? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just saying there might be one particular oh, message that was put on just before we we started recording that might be really insightful. I, okay, I so knows. Sam Lamter says six out of uh, six point five out of ten. It's all right. The villain is not one I like that much, but I do like the time period. I also hate Rose and the Doctor riding together in the way they are. It seems like they're a couple. I sort of of disagree with you there, Sam, since they sort of are a couple. But Alex Pierce, too, says the first full episode of Doctor Who I saw, so I have to say, is pretty damn good. Uh, This wasn't my first. We still haven't got to that yet. Oh, there it is. Um, Harrison says, underrated. It's not amazing, but it's certainly a decent watch. It's an okay episode. Um, not the worst, but not greatly written. Um, the Trenzalore Archive says, average episode, easy to watch. However, the writing lets it down in parts. And Harry Murdoch says, feed me. <laughs> oh, I like that guy. I think we should have him on the podcast. Uh, I don't know. Well, we, I, hmm. anyway, anyway, I'll go back to before I was rudely interrupted. You can follow us on Twitter at Bigger on the Pod, YouTube, Bigger on the Inside Podcast, ACAST shows.acast.com forward slash bigger on the inside. Leave us a five-star review on iTunes uh, or wherever you're listening to this, really. Email us bigger on the inside pod at gmail.com and Instagram as well, bigger on the pod over on Instagram as well. Instagram's fun. I like Instagram. We get more instant feedback than you do on Twitter. More instant feedback. Oh, Christ's sake. Anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> and uh, we'll I'm see you me. again next week. For should, should we do next week's as one episode? It's a two parter, but I'd quite like to do it as one episode. Maybe I don't know. We we'll have to talk about that because a lot happens. Although it is a two parter, a lot happens in those two episodes. It's a pretty packed two parter. Yeah. Well, we'll see how yeah. it goes. Anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. What did we do last time? We did uh, we did Age of Steel and Rise of Simon as one episode, didn't we? That's where maybe we'll split yeah. this one up. Maybe.
But then we're going to split the ending up as well. Are we going to do that as one big episode? I think the finale we should definitely... I think series finales we should definitely split up. Okay, okay, we'll do that. So join us next week. We don't know what we're doing. And uh, I'll say bye. Bye, everybody. Harry, do you want to say ta-ra? Bye-bye. Oh, wait. Do you want me to say actually ta-ra? Oh, you can say something quickly. I've got my finger on the recording stop button. So hurry up and say something. Ta-ra! Make sure you subscribe to the official Bigger on the Inside podcast.